What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Culture 316 podcast. I am your one of your hosts and producers, Jordan Nahisi. Joined by the return of Gothmo. How is everybody? I'm in my Wednesday era. <laughs> my Wednesday era is absolutely nuts. Thank you guys so much for joining us per usual. And once again, we really, really appreciate the support. Once again, if you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify Podcasts, be sure to give us a five stars. Subscribe to the pod. It's how we grow in popularity. And if you're on YouTube, which we saw a 20 subscriber jump in about a week. So if you're on YouTube and you're coming across us for the first time, welcome to the family. Thank you for tuning in and be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Also, if y'all like us and you like the show, be sure to kick it with us on uh, Saturday because it's NXT deadline and we're going to have a 316 space. So pull up. It's always a good time. Once again, you have to go to our Twitter at Culture316 to join us. And we'll be giving predictions later into the show. Uh, But without further ado, let me pull out my handy dandy iPad, which shows that I am smart. (laughs) And we're going to get into the first topic of the show. So as many people have noticed, uh, it seems like WWE slash Jey Uso was unable to trademark Yeet. Uh, And since then, all Yeet merchandise has been pulled from WWEshop.com. And Jey Uso is unable to say Yeet on air. Uh, I thought it was because uh, of the Vine creator who... Coined the term yeet, the cultural dance that was the yeet uh, in the mid 2010s. But it turns out there is another wrestler who is, who actually trademarked the term prior to WWE exploring a trademark. Listen, they're the Paleans, and we need more ways to. <laughs> the Paleans to, is what we call them now. Now we're we sticking have more with way, that. Paleans either, it's is either, it. It's, it's either Paleans or Napkin Americans. But. <laughs> We have to, but, but I wanted to know how you felt about it because it, at first I thought it was because they wanted to kind of stray away from the term yeet because they didn't want to intrude upon a black creator's uh, uh, intellectual property. But it turns out that a independent wrestler has trademarked it already and is already using uh, money for merchandise or already using it for merchandise and other things. So Mo, want to know your take on this. It just feels racial. <laughs> Like, honestly, I'm going to come out the gate and say it. it feels racial just because, like, not for nothing. Like, you're in the smaller leagues. If anything, it should kind of make you feel happy that um, a wrestler is coining the turn and it became something that just stuck. You know what I mean? So, and it, it works. Like, I love seeing that whole press conference with even Cody just being a jokester and being laid back and seeing, like, it's just fun. It's something that just sticks with everybody. Um, and it, it almost comes off like he's bitter and he's jealous or something because obviously it didn't stick because if it, if it did stick, I would know about it. You would know about it. Did, did nobody know who this man was? Right. <laughs> that was running around right. saying and selling on merchandise. Now you're mad because somebody else was popping got to stick like that. Like, Jimmy's so good with that. Um, so I'm, I'm pressed just because I feel it's anti-black of him, but at the same time, I'm like, well, I said, Jimmy, it's Jay. Jay, I always get the mixed up. My bad, y'all. My bad. But like Jay, like he's so creative and quick with the, with the words and lips and whatnot. So I feel like he's going to find something else that sticks if he doesn't want to do something else. But I like he, I think everyone likes she, like he's just fun to say. It's just fun to watch him just be goofy and be himself, man. I don't know. What do you think about it, Jordan? Here's what I will say. I don't think that it's racial. Yes, it I is. do think that is a money thing, though. I feel like WWE should have ran him like whatever he wanted and as far as money was concerned, because I feel like that's such a missed opportunity. Like, I feel like the yeet was sticking with Jay. It was kind of synonymous with his personality. Like you said, he did it at a press conference. He did it. Um just kind of in multiple places, the, the the merch was selling, the merch was going, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I feel like WWE could have like, could have like forwarded him a few more bands um, unless like the, the wrestler was asking for an, an exuberant amount of money in which, no, don't I do asked for a contract. What the fuck is she talking about? Right. I'm not, I'm not signing you off of some damn yeet. Like, no, you already have our yeet, man. You just stay doing your little bingo halls. But yeah, I, I don't... Not a bingo hall. I mean, it may be racial. I don't know. But I just feel like WWE should have... Whatever the, the price 
if it was within reason, I feel like WWE just should have ran the bands because this is something that's sticking with Jay. But I think Jay is so over and Jay is so popular amongst the WWE universe that if it's not Yeet, it's going to be something else because it's not Yeet that's sticking as much as it is Jay Uso sticking. So I feel like whatever he creates, I think it's just going to be just as successful. But I don't know, man. We're going to see. But I think I think that kind of concludes our little yeet segment. But let us know what you think. Like, should WWE just should have just ran whomever thousands of more dollars? Do you think that Jey Uso is going to create something that's going to stick just as well? Drop it in the comments below. Let us know what you think. But we're moving on because it was also reported that allegedly – uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling's soup biggest one of his, their biggest superstars, Kazuchika Okada, is set uh, to be a free agent at the stop at the top of 2024, and he is seriously weighing other wrestling companies. AEW is one of them. WWE is another. So hypothetically, let's just say Kazuchika Okada does not want to re-sign with New Japan Pro Wrestling. Where should he go? If I'm, if you're Okada, do you want to go to WWE? Do you want to go to AEW? Honestly, because I've heard in the past that WWE attempted multiple times to sign Okada, and he just mm-hmm. kind of like had some backhanded comments. But I feel like since then, WWE has kind of like found their their footing and they know how to book certain people better. I mean, their, their biggest stars, I feel like are like must see, you know what I mean? Before I think we were all complaining and that, Oh, it's all about the bloodline, the bloodline, but I feel like they got a little bit of something going everywhere. So mm-hmm. much so that, I mean, again, they kind of stole AEW's biggest people and we, we're just going along with it. No complaints. Cause we see the changes happening before our eyes. Mm -hmm. Um, so I feel like with Okada, he would have a lot to do in WWE, um, whether you want to just plug him into NXT for a big pop rating, or if you want to just, um, put him down the avenue of the main roster and have him debuted on Raw, like, I feel like there's more for him to do and give him, like, that grandiose feel, that grandiose stage. I can already see them being over the top of his entrance already, um, and him getting wherever the fuck he wants. Mm -hmm. Um, likewise, I do see that Tony Khan would with Okada, but my question is, do they have enough for Okada to work with over there considering, Mm -hmm. I feel like they're in a little bit of a decline over there in AEW just because they got so much going on at once, a lot of Mm -hmm. bad news at once. That's unfortunate. And you could like look at it in one of two ways. You could like look at it as, okay, like maybe we could have Okada be our new face. Like we lost Punk, but haha, like, you know, we got Okada. You know what I mean? Like the face mm. of um, New Japan. He's quite literally like New Japan's John Cena. You know what yeah. I mean? So you literally. could still do a lot with Okada. It's just that, do you think that they would know how to properly book angles that we would care about to mm. get invested in Okada? Um, obviously, the. Uh, the AEW fan base, since it's more like indie Mark fans, would take to him easily and they would love this decision. Um, as opposed to WWE fans, not everyone watches Japan. But I feel like since Hunter obviously watches Japanese wrestling and he probably already knows very much about Okada, he definitely would take his booking very seriously and there'd be a lot mm-hmm. to do over there. So I'm not opposed to either or side, but I think it'd be pretty cool if I saw him having some major WrestleMania moments over in the E. That's just my personal opinion. But what do you think about it? So in my opinion, I don't think he should go to AEW. Reason being is one of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of, well, at least from what I've seen, I don't I don't think we've seen anything from Will Ospreay yet. And I don't think that we can judge his kind of arrival. A lot of it is a copy and paste from New Japan into AEW or with some slight modifications, right? Like we look at Jay White, he has the same entrance, same, you know, name, same everything and has even brought over the Bullet Club gold name and it just feels like New Japan Jay White with some slight modifications that can make him more friendly and more privy to the American audience. Now, if you want to keep your New Japan stick, that's great. But if you're looking for something new, I would try and I would test the waters of WWE. And I think Okada should look at what's happening in WWE. Because look at Kyrie Sane, look at Asuka, look at EO Sky. 
just everything that they've been doing with damage control, it, it's very, very clear. They may not all have championships, but they matter. They're all getting TV time. They're all getting main event time. They're all invested in a storyline that is prominent in their division. I would also take a look at what's happening with Shinsuke Nakamura. We have not seen Shinsuke get booked this well since NXT, right? Mm -hmm. We see him on air with Cody Rhodes, who's a main event player. Granted, Shinsuke had some matches with Seth Rollins for the World Heavyweight title. He's had a, a couple of matches. I feel like the booking of it is starkly different from when he was feuding with AJ Styles because it feels like Shinsuke is kind of stronger now than he was after his feud with AJ Styles for the WWE Championship, especially now that we see him in a main event style program with Cody Rhodes. Another thing that he's been teasing is Shinsuke bringing the chaos. That is a stable that Shinsuke and Okada were a part of in New Japan Pro Wrestling. So maybe an Okada-Nakamura tandem in WWE can be something something to kind of look forward to. Maybe coming in and they can win the tag titles. Maybe coming in and Okada can hold a world title and Shinsuke can hold an intercontinental title or vice versa. I just feel like WWE has some more creatively intriguing possibilities than AEW because when you look at the big names in AEW, it's kind of a been there, done that situation. Kenny Omega, Jay White, like we, we can go down to Will Ospreay, like we can go down the list. It's like he's kind of been there and done that already. So if I'm him, I would go to AEW, but you know, we'll see what happens. I mean, I AW? feel like he may, huh? You said AEW? You want me to go no, to I feel like he, I feel like he should go to WWE. Okay. I feel like he should go to WWE, but I feel like he's actually going to stay in New Japan Pro Wrestling just because he's he's he may be just be comfortable over there. But I don't know. We'll see. But we want to know what you guys think. If Kazuchika Okada actually is a free agent, do you believe that he should go to AEW or do you think he should go to WWE? Let us know in the comments. But we're going to move on. So a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about WWE and the Big 12. Big 12 is a major football conference in the NCAA. Uh, and we saw that partnership kind of come to fruition this past week because the Texas Longhorns won the Big 12 championship. And who was there to present them with the uh, Big 12 WWE championship belt? None under than Texas native, The Undertaker. Also, Nelly performed at halftime and Jade Cargill actually presented Nelly with a WWE championship belt. Um Wanted to know your thoughts on this, the inclusion of Undertaker, the inclusion of Jade, uh, and kind of seeing this partnership uh, come into fruition on such a big stage that doesn't have much to do with pro wrestling. I mean, first of all, shout out to my grandfather. Um, I love me some Undertaker. Um, he looks <laughs> so happy. He looks so healthy in those pictures. I'm so happy just to see him just doing well. Um, and I, you know, I expected him to have some form of like, you know, entwinement that's not even a word but i'm gonna make it a word entwinement mm -hmm. with um wwe so i love the fact that they used him in this way it was something simple light showing face i mean everyone knows the undertaker what better way to put this you know collaboration together than to present the man that's like kind of like the face of wwe in my personal mm -hmm. opinion um so i love that um the fact that jade carjo had a a part i love that already because they haven't, like, done anything in terms of, like, putting her in the ring yet. And I feel like the smartest thing to do is use every form of J. Cardell there is and just build towards the hype. And one thing that she's done in AEW was be um, a promotional face over mm. there when they yes. had other events to pretty much promote the TBS Women's uh, Championship belt and obviously herself. You know what I mean? Like, she looks great. She sounds great. She's used to being in front of cameras and people. So I feel like she's a great leader to have for that. It's pretty cool to see her collaborating with Nelly. I mean, last time I checked, it's not her first time um, being in a wrestling area and uh, being around um, – musicians because didn't wasn't she in the same place as trina the first time in, in, in w uh in trina AEW? and bow wow R right trina right and bow wow. So i kind of love that they stole that idea and they just decided to put her next to nelly it's just like we could do that too over here but better so because <laughs> who's bow wow in 2023 <laughs> and i and i love i love hey. trina 
I love Bow Wow. wow. I love Bow Wow. Okay. okay. Bow wow's well, good. Right. Jordan loves Bow Wow. <laughs> He's his only fan he has left. But Nelly, I mean, come on now. Come on now. That's, that's a good cash in and it just looks great. She looks great next to anybody. She looks great being a presenter. So good on them. I think that was very smart. Um, a little bit petty if you ask me, just because. Just, just because. But I love it. I think it, it was great. Um, and I love what they're doing with Jade already. Even if she hasn't touched the, the ropes. I actually don't want her to touch the ropes already. She made a comment about that um, in some interview that she wants the fans to the fans to be uh, patient and wait. And I feel like mm. this is great. All this building is, is going to give her time to um, adjust to what the E wants out of her to get better in the ring so she could probably put on better matches than she was in AEW. Mm-hmm. But, like, it's going to build so much intriguement because it's just, like, she's everywhere but the ring, but they're making her seem like this big thing. Like, what is she going to do next? Right. I love it. I love it. But what do you think about it, Jordan? I think it's perfect. Um, one of the things that I feel like AEW was able to do successfully was use legends in a non-wrestling way to benefit uh, their talent and their company. WWE's kind of done it, but I feel like they haven't. They didn't at a time do it at the level that AEW did, and I feel like we're finally kind of seeing WWE kind of take that and kind of refine it in their own way. This partnership is one example of that. I feel like mm-hmm. Undertaker a Texas native presenting the big 12 championship to the Texas Longhorns. I mean, like it doesn't really get much better than that. Um, Not to even mention that, you know, obviously his wife, Michelle McCool was present who also in her own right is a WWE divas legend, right? We have um, Samantha Irvin uh, was present on the sidelines at the game. And then of course, Jade Cargill presenting Nelly with that WWE championship belt. Um, I think it was like legitimately perfect. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned Jade kind of being patient and taking her time. Like we heard Triple H in a, in a press conference just talk about, you know, when we brought her in, how, you know, we wanted her to be prepared for everything. And so we're kind of getting her ready so that she can be prepared for everything, which I think is a very, very smart move. Um, and then on top of that, her being in the same space as Nelly, I think it's great. Also, shout out to Nelly. And Ashanti because they're about to have a child. I forgot to mention that they are. I think Ashanti is pregnant with child. It was reported on I think U.S. Weekly or Peace. Yeah, I mean they, that 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 was a thing twenty years ago. It's a right, thing now. But I mean, like, did he just give her a ring? I, I don't even know to be honest. But but shout outs to them for for That's for so embarking cool. on that embarking on that journey. But yeah, like I feel like it's just it just makes sense. This is one of those partnerships that makes sense, and it kind of continues. In the line of what Nick Khan has been trying to do, which is extend the reach of WWE, but doing it in ways that it's cool and it makes sense. It doesn't feel forced. It feels like a very natural thing. Uh, So that's really all I had to say about that. But we want to know how y'all feel about the WWE Big 12 partnership kind of coming to this stage. So, yeah, drop your comments below and let us know what you think. But we are moving on. So... In addition to extending the reach, well, while speaking on extending the reach, it has been reported uh, that Becky Lynch and Bianca Belair are now Guinness World Book of Rec- <laughs> Book of World Records holders for being involved in the Fortnite concert. Um, I'm gonna actually check to see um, what they got. Uh, I don't know if it has the to world do with record like the for biggest screen, the biggest uh, video game cover or something. I like think that. something like that. I think like the largest something. But be, needless to say, Bianca Belair and Becky Lynch are considered Guinness Book of World Record uh, holders or, or people who are involved in that. So I kind of wanted to know, how do you feel about this Becky Bianca Fortnite partnership and them being in the Guinness Book of World Records for their inclusion in, in Fortnite's feet? Um, and sorry, what was the cover that they used? Was it, was it the cover from like the video games? Like from... I think so. I think so. Um... Like, like with the... Like when Becky Lynch had her own cover? I'm not, I don't even know if Bianca ever had her cover, even, but... I want to know what it looks like real quick before I comment anything. I think, um... I just want to make... The reason why I'm asking is, while you look that up, it's just that they have gamers that I thought would have been a really, really cool opportunity to just, like, put them towards the front, because we all know, like, people like Dakota Kai and Zelina Vega are are all about 
the gaming stuff. And of course, we have like the New Day too. So I just thought it would be kind of cool if they kind of get that opportunity to the gamers of the E, being that from my oh. knowledge. Oh, here it is. Uh, they took home the Guinness World Record for playing a video game on the largest display ever created. This is coming from KSNV. Um, but yeah, they they were essentially in the Guinness Book of World Records for playing a video game on the largest display ever. Uh, it was, I think it was a, yeah, something along those lines. They played, they played a video game uh, on the largest display ever. Um, so I just wanted to make, I had to make sure that also correction, it wasn't Fortnite. It was Pac-Man. It was a 10 minute game of Pac-Man. Um, so my apologies for that, but essentially it was a, it was Bianca Belair, Becky Lynch. They broke the world record for the largest video game or playing a 10 minute game of Pac-Man on the largest digital screen. And the, the screen was powered by Xfinity, which I believe is a company under Comcast, which is affiliated with NBC Universal. So that is the world record. Like that's what they did. So now that we have all the context, how do you feel about it? Do you think it's cool? Do you think it's whatever? Let me know I what you think. I about always it. think it's cool. I always think it's cool when they have um which call it, they have any form of Guinness Book of World Records. Cause I feel like the last time I ever heard they had like a world record was like Mark Henry. You know what I mean? Um, Like legitimately being the strongest man in the world, um, which is pretty cool back then. So I like the fact that they're doing it now and they're giving that opportunity to the women. Because as I just said before, um, they really could have went with Dakota or Zelina for this. Like that's why I find it just a bit odd. But I understand Mm. that Becky and Bianca are like their their female PR team besides um, Jay Cargo at the moment. So I get it. I like that. I, I, I actually love it, actually. Um, it's, it's a bit odd, a bit quirky, but, I mean, it's just to give them just something, some accolade, just, just another thank you. Like, thank you, Becky and Bianca, you know, like, we're going to put you in the, in the Guinness Book of World Records just because. I'm not mad at it. But like I said, it would have been kind of cool to put, like, the people who you know are geeks. I mean, Shotzi could have been in, in, even in that, too. Shotzi, Zelina, Dakota. Uh, who, who are the gamers on the guy side that we have? We have, like, the New Day. Um but that that's my only criticism of it, but I'm not mad at the the uh the actual record. It's it's cool. I mean, I would love to play on a gigantic screen of Pac-Man or Mortal Kombat. This is me. But what do you Mortal think Kombat. about it, Jordan? <laughs> I I think it's tough. I also so let's start here. Uh Bianca Belair is developing quite the resume, especially in the past five years. Being mm-hmm. one of the first two black women to main event WrestleMania. Uh, holding the titles that she's ho- that she's held, being a face at Snickers, uh, Slim Jim, Cricket Wireless, and then she's moving into the reality TV space with her own show with Montez Ford. Like she's C- the C four campaign. Like it's very very clear that Bianca Belair is one of the most commercially successful faces that WWE has produced in the past five years. Point blank. Period. And Becky Lynch obviously is another one of those women who is one of the most commercially successful faces that WWE has produced in the last, I would say, 10 years. But really, her kind of once-in-a-lifetime run that kind of skyrocketed her kind of started in 2018 yeah. uh, when she kind of led the charge on her her main event to WrestleMania. Um, but you have two of the most successful faces in the company. I feel like they couldn't go wrong with them. Like out of all the people on the WWE roster, they kind of are the perfect marriage of uh, appreciation, respect, and admiration from the WWE universe for what they've done in the ring. And then their crossover notability to people outside of WWE who have may have seen them. So I feel like they couldn't have gone with two better people. Now, if it was for like a different game and we're talking about like Comic Con, of course, I would say get get a Dakota Kai, get the New Day, get Shotzi, get all of them. Because I feel like because that's a more niche audience, you can get wrestlers who are a little bit more niche and more known in the video game community. Even Zelina Vega, like I would love to see her get involved because she's another one who's big into streaming. And, and I feel like she's a great representation of the company and someone who is very passionate about video games. But I think this is great. I think this is super tough. And I'm very, very happy for the women involved. And and once again, I'm not going to complain about a black woman being in the book of, of world records Never. at all. You're not, you're, you're not going to hear that out of me. 
No, no, no. So shout out to them. But we want to know how you guys feel about Bianca Belair and Becky Lynch being world record holders. Let us know in the comments below. But now we're shifting gears a little bit. We're moving on from WWE to AEW because while WWE seems to be getting a lot of good news, AEW has been kind of going through it just a little bit. Um, so Chris Jericho, I believe, was on a podcast recently. He he said a lot of things that can be up for debate. But one of the things that I found very, very interesting that I wanted to talk about was that he said that he has told the AEW roster that everyone should spend at least six months working for Vince McMahon to understand what the wrestling business is all about. Do you agree or do you disagree? I actually agree. It's just that Chris Jericho is interesting for that just because he's like – He's like a Trump over there in AEW just because, like, he's been in wrestling for so fucking long. He's seen everything, everything, even before WWE. Like, he's seen everything and he's a veteran and he's, like, I think the last only, like, big name veteran that could still kind of go that they got over there. Like he was like their company face. And I still think to a degree he is their company face. So he could, he could afford to say what he wants and get away with it. But he's credible. He's very much credible here saying that just because I feel like once you went through the WWE machine, you understand how wrestling should work. Um, Like we have a passion for wrestling. Uh, Well, this is just levels to this fan shit, right? But I feel like when it comes to like um, wrestling, yes, there's the matches and what goes on in the ring. Um, but then there's like the general global wrestling casual audience and right. we fell in love with wrestling, not necessarily just because what goes on in the ring, but because like the whole thing that we're seeing and now that we're older and we're able to like absorb the information of what goes on backstage and we grew mm-hmm. up on pretty much WWE, I feel like we understand what a business looks like when it's properly ran. Not morally ran, but properly ran with structure. And that's that's right. the big thing that I think Jericho was getting at. It's not so much of like being a, a WWE drone versus the E drone. Uh, sorry, AW drone versus the uh, E drone thing but i do feel like people should spend time there because um you get to sharpen your character they have an actual pc for you to actually like learn and train you have legends to speak up to um that are now in suits so they're ready to tell you things from a business side and from um a talent side of how to move how to correct things um Again, because it's more about structure than making people happy. Um, you know how to conduct yourself. And so you could go elsewhere and be money. I feel like mm-hmm. if you were to like go from AEW and come over here, you either had to have it or you didn't. Just because the best thing you have to sell towards the audience is what you do in that ring. But like, do you know how to like conduct yourself? Is are you someone who we could like put out there like a Bianca Belair? You know, mm-hmm. like we like you know, hence us giving her the uh, the Guinness Book of World Records or whatnot, or someone like Jay. Jay just happened to have it, hence why she's over <laughs> there. But like, she already had a background of how to like kind of properly conduct herself and sat in rooms with meetings. And she's just this kind of already cleaned up and polished for this. So mm-hmm. I feel like what Jericho was more or less is getting at is just that, yo, um, if you go through WWE, everything else kind of becomes light working. You know how to be the star for yourself and the star that the company wants. And you kind of help you help them. But if you kind of just go through the indie system, I feel like you're going to have a warped view of like what wrestling should be. Because technically mm-hmm. it's not about you. It's about the men in the suits in the crowd and what they think, not so much what you think. That's mm-hmm. the entertainment business for you, right? Yeah. WWE gets it. They get it. But what do you think about it? So I think all of that is 100% true. But I think when we talk about Chris Jericho, first of all, what he says is so credible and so true because I feel like there are certain guys who have just kind of been through it all in this business. And there are certain guys who have been through it all in WWE, right? Like when we talk about like the talent that AEW has, and we talk about guys like John Mox, guys like Brian Danielson, guys like Chris Jericho. These aren't just people who are ex-WWE superstars. These are WrestleMania main eventers or WrestleMania main event caliber talent. These are people, 
These are people who are at one point or another were seen as people who are at the top of their company and at the top of their game. Chris Jericho, before coming to AEW, was the first ever uh, undisputed world champion in WWE history. That was one of his selling points for a very, very long time. And so when we look at people who have been through the WWE system, we owe it all to Vince McMahon. I know, and yeah. once again, I don't stand morally, I don't stand behind anything that man has been accused of. But when we talk about the man who is single handedly responsible for some of the greatest moments and greatest characters in the history of not just WWE, but pro wrestling, it's Vince McMahon. And so even the details that Vince puts emphasis on makes the difference from if you are good or if you are great. For example, music cues. I'm looking at a lot of these entrances right now, with the exception of like a swerve or whomever, a lot of cats ain't hitting music cues. But we saw what happens when people hit music cues. The Triple H and the spitting out of the water, Undertaker and the gong. When John Cena comes out after like the trumpet sound and stuff, music cues matter. Right. The glass lake was stone cold. The if you smell like everything. And these are details that Vince McMahon stressed. Right. And so I feel like even though I, I'm not I don't necessarily agree with some of the stuff that he's done morally, when we're talking about the greatest creative mind in the history of this business, someone who is so attentive to detail and the little details that make wrestlers stand out for us, it's all due to Vince McMahon. And so I think that what he's saying is super reputable and super true. May not agree with all the creative decisions he's made, especially within the past five years, but like that's just natural. You're not going to agree with everything that somebody stands on or, or does. But man, like Vince is that guy. Like Vince is that guy. And he's that super credible and super smart when it pertains to pro- professional wrestling. But I want to know what y'all think. Do you think that young superstars, young wrestlers should work with Vince McMahon for six months in order to get a good understanding of the pro wrestling business? Let us know. In the comments below, that's not the only thing that we've been hearing about from AEW. Uh, it was reported by Dave Meltzer as, as, and a couple of other outlets that allegedly uh, the AEW disciplinary committee has been handing out fines for comments raid made by certain wrestlers on social media. Um, allegedly, Britt Baker is one of the people who has been fined. Uh, Matt Hardy is another one of the people who have been fined. Um, and on top of that, uh, it seems as if the former head of AEW post-production, Kevin Sullivan, Kevin Sullivan has been released for, uh, released from AEW. And and I I want to know from your perspective, does, are we seeing a, just a shift in direction in AEW or do you think it's the beginning of the end? I don't want to say the beginning of the end because um, in any business, any business that that does start up, especially on like such a large platform like Tony Khan has, you're going to have to unfortunately deal with the wave. Like you're going to have peaks and you're going to have dips. This is their major dip. And Mm -hmm. it's kind of like where you either put up or shut up. Obviously, your formula is not working. (laughs) You know, you got you got your um, talents running over you. You got people quitting. Um, The ratings might be dropping. Um, I feel like. He has had a major reality check since, and he's just trying to clean things up. Um, I mean, I feel like we discussed it so many times on this channel, so many times, but um, this is what happens when you don't have rules, you know, and you don't have boundaries. Um, now he's playing catch up with that, and he's understanding mm-hmm. that, all right, certain people got to go. Um, and certain people need to learn to shut the fuck up. So if you're not going to listen to little old me, you know, I'm paying, you know, your checks to you all right well now i'm gonna find you and that's gonna straighten you out real quick because just because this is AEW and you're still getting a nice check and i let you know that hey i'm gonna give you better treatment than in wwe well you know that doesn't mean you're gonna disrespect me disrespect my company mm-hmm. anything you have to say and from what i understanding um uh brit baker got fined for something she said on twitter and matt hardy uh went i think on like a podcast or an interview Regardless, you're representing the company. If you really have a complaint, you should be able to come to your boss about it or whoever is in the chain of command to leave that over to Tony Khan. So 
Um, it sounds like it sucks, but I don't think it sucks. I feel like within due time, you're going to like see a lot more structure and we're going to hear less bullshit about what's going on backstage because it's very indie over there. Yeah. Um, and I feel like he's, he has to have learned the hard way that, all right, I don't really like WWE. You know, I want to be the, the more likable boss, the most, the more likable company, but being nice doesn't get you respected. It doesn't get you anywhere, sir. So you're going to have to do some things you don't like and he's he's kind of pulling some things out of the Vince McMahon book and finding people was one of them mm. people got a lot of fines even the, the top of the top got fined for whatever just because you're not about to make my company look bad because you have feelings or you just want to do something like mm. business is business at the end of the day so I'm not mad at it um, as far as you said that uh, Kevin Sullivan or whatever yeah, guy Kevin Sullivan got released from AEW who is uh, well this is allegedly uh, and he was the head of post production, so a lot of trailers, a lot of like, a lot of the content that we saw AEW produce. As far as you know, it probably went through him. So, oh, okay. Um, well, again, I didn't even know who this Kevin Sullivan person was. I'm like, is this a wrestler? I actually, I actually had to look it up. <laughs> I was like, who is right. this man? Um, I mean. I feel like another complaint that AEW gets is that it also appears to production wise look very indie. So it doesn't shock me that as of right mm. now, they want to go in a different direction with that as well. I'm not complaining too much about how it looks, but it's just that if you're like a billion dollar company, I, or at least you're ran by this billion dollar owner, I feel like the production should be stepped up. I think you just mentioned stuff about like the music cues. Mm -hmm. um there's times where um i think like they're doing like production stuff with like interviews and i feel like i can barely hear the audio um i just feel like does, is he responsible for anything visual wise like with like lighting and stuff like that or is that just a whole different department? that's a different that's a different when different we talk department. about when we talk about post-production we're talking about packages we're talking about trailers we're talking about a lot of the visual element that we see um, on screen, it could be build up packages, it could be interviews, all that usually runs through some type of post production head or post production manager. I'm only speaking from experience. But. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's not bad, but I mean, it still needs more developing. So, I mean, if they got somebody else, I'm, I'm interested, I'm interested in seeing if they have anything more polished. Um, mm. it's unfortunate that the dude lost his job, but I mean, oh well, that's kind of business. <laughs> what do you think about it? So I'll start with the Kevin Sullivan one. I think that one of the things that we had kind of heard rumblings of is that AEW wanted to go in a different direction as far as like its match style. They wanted to do stuff that was more New Japan stylistically. Uh, and I feel like stuff like that drives your production decisions as far as how you want to shoot matches, how you want to highlight certain things. And we even see that influence on the Continental Classic, which is very, very similar to the G1, um, a New Japan tournament. So I'm not surprised. Obviously, it's never good to hear about somebody losing their job. Kevin Sullivan is someone who is knee deep in the game, someone who is in WWE and has created a lot of memorable packages. Um, and so I, you know, my, my heart goes out to him. Um, so I'm, but I'm very, very intrigued. However, I do think that this is kind of a sign of the times more than anything that AEW is kind of shifting directions and that AEW is kind of like in a reset mode because certain things just got to happen. I feel like one of the biggest things that AEW kind of prided itself on behind the scenes uh, was, oh, it just feels this or it feels that or it feels fresh. Uh, and you can't build a company on vibes. You got to build a company on principles. You got to build a company on values. And so when you have a company or an entity in which you're more rooted in the feeling of then the reality of you start to experience a lot of instability. And I think that that's what we started to see a lot because of the lack of structure, but because of the lack of protocol. And I feel like that's the reason why we have an AEW discipline committee now. And I think that it's great for the company. I think that it's great for the industry. Like you said, when you got people like Britt Baker and a Matt Hardy, I get it, right? Matt Hardy more than Britt, but like you're successful, you have grievances, you want to air it out, but baby, like this is a new time in AEW. And on top of that, you're a representative of the company. Like one of the things that I will always commend Tony Khan for is that he has been very ethical in his pay scale. 
right? Like the women at the top make just as much as the men at the top, or at least that was something that he kind of prided itself on when AEW was introduced. So if I'm paying you all this money, understand like you're a representative of the company, number one. And also like, it's a part of the game. You're not going to be on top forever. The people that were world champions two to three years ago are not world champions now. The people that were getting chunks of segments back then are not getting chunks of segments now, right? I feel like the wheel keeps on turning. We have to continue to reinvent ourselves. We have to continue to develop new stars. And that may mean that some TV time is going to this person instead of you. I love Britt Baker. She's produced some great moments, but Tony Storm is, is doing her life's work right now as the AEW World Women's Champion. And sometimes, sis, that means you got to take the back seat. The camera ain't going to be on you. You're not going to get promo time. And guess what? That doesn't mean that you're not talented. That doesn't mean that they don't have plans to utilize you. But sis, it's not your turn. When it was your turn, you made the most of it. Congratulations. But this ain't about you right now, baby girl. And sometimes you just got to, you know, say, you know what? Is this, do I want to be on TV? Absolutely. Do I want the promo time? Absolutely. But I got to think about what's best for my division. I got to think about what's best for the company. And right now, Tony Storm being the face of the women's division isn't exactly the worst decision in the world. All right? Like, come on, we got to pull it together. Like... And, and, and we'll talk about the Hardys a little bit later because I think my, my, my feelings are a little bit different. But overall, like not all talent is going to be featured all the time. I feel like there's certain pl- people that should be highlighted still. But like at the same time, you only have, what, two, three hours of television per week. I think five based on if you, you know, talk about Dynamite, Collision and Rampage. Simultaneously, it's like. There's only but so much time. And if we want to create a wrestling-centric product, that means that we're going to have to have long matches. We're going to have to have things that may dip into time that you would have normally had. So that's my little opinion on that. But I like... I just think that AEW is in the midst of a well-needed reset that's going to deal with the structure of the company as well as just a difference in presentation of the on-screen product. I think it's needed and I think it's great. And that shout out to Tony Khan and Brian, Brian Danielson for doing their thing. But we want to know how you feel. Uh, do you think that this is the beginning of the decline of AEW or do you think this is just a much needed shift? You know how we think. Let us know what you think. But we're moving on. Let me look at my iPad to see what the next topic is. Ah, yes. So one of the things we I actually meant to talk about this like two weeks ago, but like I was sick. Mo has some things to handle. But PWI released their top 10 tag teams. And uh, it's 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 a polarizing list. It's a very, very polarizing list. But I'm going to give you the top 10. Uh, so number 10 is seven up. I think it's 7UPP. I think they're a New Japan tag team. We have Damage Control. We have Judgment Day. We have The Acclaimed. We have ABC. um, And we we have the Motor City Machine Guns. We have Bishimon. We have Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn at number three. We have Aussie Open at number two. And we have FTR at number one. So I want to know how you think of this list. Can't hear you. Oh, I love that for me. Um, (laughs) um, Okay, so I heard a few names that I like up there that I expected. Um, Damage Control, I'm happy to see an all-women's faction be Mm -hmm. bought to the top. I think, first of all, it was the first time we've seen an all-women's faction since, like, I don't know, uh, the the, the blondes from Impact or something. Like, I I got actual three-woman faction going on, but we got, like, four going. Um... I'm happy for Bailey um, and for all the women in damage control. I feel like it's pretty honorable for them to be up there on the list. So I love that for them. Um, I also heard you say the acclaimed. I mean, the the acclaimed has been doing great work. I, the, their best work was definitely earlier on this year. Um, and even towards the end of last year. But they put out some really great work for the first half of the year. So not shocked that, that, that they're there. Um, who's number four? Uh, number four... Was Bishiman? I I have not Do seen or heard of Bishiman. I must have the wrong list in front of me. 
Brent 2023, right? 2023. Okay. If I'm not mistaken. When I type it in, I should say it says FTR, Aussie Open, Owens and Sammy, Bishmon, Motor City. Uh, yeah. Motor City. Yeah. Now we're, look, we're looking at the same one. Okay, yeah, you counted backwards. One. You counted. You counted. Backwards. I went from ten to one. I went from okay. ten to one. Yeah. Oh shit! I got nervous. I was like, did I pull up the wrong one for my damn self? Whew. Okay. Great. Glad that we that we figured that out. <laughs> but right. um, I I'm not surprised FTR is at the top. I'm really not. I don't know who's Aussie Open. Who's Aussie Open? Aussie Open is one of my favorite tag teams. They're in AEW right now. Uh, they are a part of the United Empire faction, which is headed up by Will Ospreay. Um, one of the members at the moment is currently injured, so they haven't been as active. But Aussie Open is a great tag team. They've had great matches. Uh, they were at All In. I believe that they faced actually... MJF and Adam Cole for the Ring of Honor tag team titles. They're great. Aussie Open is great. They're part of AEW. Um, oh, okay. Did, I, did we see these people in London? Yeah, yeah, they were on the kickoff show. Okay. Yeah, I like them. I remember liking them. No, I'm trying to remember why I like them. Hold on. Don't you be giving me an attitude? <laughs> I'm giving you sass. I'm giving you all the sass. Jordan's giving me all the sass, y'all. I, I um... But yeah, who else was on here? Judgment Day. Judgment Day has been doing a really good job. I'm, I'm honestly surprised that they're not higher on the list. Like, especially Rhea has been busting her ass to bring this, bring the, the Judgment Day up. Like, literally, they're kind of like almost neck and neck with like the work that we that we were getting out of um, the Bloodline. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm very much surprised that they're so low. Um, I'm not necessarily upset at it but i expected them to be like top five that was just the one thing that kind of threw me off a little bit Mm -hmm. and abc tell me a little about abc do you know anything about them they are austin i think it's austin um ace austin and chris bay they are part of impact wrestling uh they at one point were the tag team champions they are part of bullet club and they are great. Um, this is why you need to watch Impact day. because ABC right. is is a really good tag team. They're just in Impact Wrestling, so they may not be as known as other tag teams. But yeah, Shout ABC out to is them. tough. Shout out to them. I mean, it's a. I mean, this is coming from someone who obviously does not pay attention to that much tag team wrestling. But I don't think the list is bad. The names that I wanted to see from the shows that I watch the most are here. Mm-hmm. Um. Again, congratulations to FTR and and uh, and uh, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn for being at the top of the list. I guess like when they make these lists, this is based off of like the first six months. It feels like, yeah. When I read the results, anytime so it feels like it was kind of basically up to whatever, like around the WrestleMania time or June per se. But I think it's a pretty solid list. I mean, congrats again to to uh, Judgment Day, Damage Control. Um, acclaimed. Those are like my teams I pay attention to. Um, but what's your opinion on the list? I agree. I think this is a great list. Um, I pretty much agree with kind of like the hierarchy of the tag teams. I feel like all these teams were either just great tag teams or tag teams that were involved in major, major, major storylines. Like mm-hmm. we, I, I feel like Based on how the bloodline just absolutely dominated 2023, Kevin Owens and Zami Zayn definitely belong on the list because they were intertwined with that story. Um, but I think it's a fair list. I think it's a fair list. I think it's a good list. I don't really have much to to say about it. I'm very, very eager to see what 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 everybody else says about it, though. So everyone else, ooh, that was a nice burp. For everyone else, let us know in the comments below. Uh, how you feel about PWI's top 10 tag team list of 2023, but we are moving on. So this actually leads into a conversation about arguably, not arguably, 100% one of the greatest tag teams of all time, the Hardy Boys. We talked about uh, one of Matt Hardy's comments saying that they feel kind of like ghosts backstage in AEW and how they are not properly utilized. Um, I want to know what your opinions on it are, Mo. 
Uh, are the Hardys underutilized? Are they properly utilized? Does Matt Hardy have a point? Well, Matt Hardy surely does have a fucking point because there's a hundred tag teams on here. All right. And they are num- number 94 as I'm staring dead at it. <laughs> Can you imagine just because like when I was a kid, I got into any form of tag team wrestling. If it wasn't necessarily watching Edge and Christian, it was the Hardys. Mm. It was the Hardys. Um, and it's just that I understand that there's been a lot of delay in their works, considering that um, our boy Jeff has been in and out, in and out with his issues with the, with the cops, you know, yeah. like I understand, but it feels as though since they've been back, they are kind of underutilized and they kind of almost blend in to the back with everybody else, which mm-hmm. kind of upsets me. Now I'm not expecting them to pull out like these crazy five-star classics, um, off of ladders, especially at their big age. Um, I want them to obviously wrestle safely. And I'm also not asking for the Hardys to um, be the most dominant tag team on their entire roster and give them all of the screen time. That's not what I'm asking for either. Mm -hmm. But for two brothers that were like the most impactful tag team, in my personal opinion of all time, um, I kind of expect them to have a level of booking where they still feel like they're a threat um, and they're going to inevitably, because they're still a threat, um, it's going to make that tag team that defeats them look that much better and puts them over. So it feels like something, you Absolutely. know what I mean? Um, so the idea that, that they kind of blend into the back and they're kind of just doing whatever the fuck, it kind of upsets me because they really don't have to be here. They're, they both are very wealthy men. Um, they're here because of the love for the game. Um, and they're, they're very, um, you never hear anything about the Hardys complaining. Mm. So the fact that it took this long and I'm, and if I uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure from what Matt was saying, he did try speaking to Tony. It wasn't like he just went blabbing on social media immediately. He did yeah. try to directly speak to Tony and obviously there was no change. And Jeff is Jeff. Like Jeff is so humble y'all. Like he is so humble. He knows that he's that guy. He has every right to brag, to kick down Tony Khan's door right now and tell him exactly what he deserves. But he's so just like calm and just unproblematic, minus what he does to himself. Um, right. He's so unproblematic <laughs> that he just kind of is just going with whatever he's given. But, you know, there was a point in time where Jeff wants to give up on wrestling not too long ago because he was just kind of losing that spark and then he came back. This was his choice, a brand that he went to. I mean, he literally left WWE and came straight here. Mm. Um, and I feel like he was kind of like looking for that second wind mm. coming yeah. to AEW. And it's just like, he's not, in my personal opinion, being respected enough over there. Um, and I understand like they're nice enough to work with him and work around his issues, I could see, I could, I could already see people complaining about that, saying, "Well, does he really deserve it after what he pulled?" Mm. But again, in the grand scheme, they should not be this extremely low on this list. I understand they're older, but they should be booked better, and they should be booked in such a way where it makes the rest of the tag teams that come through have to go through them at some point in their careers as they grow. And they look like a million bucks just because they went through the Hardys and they had a damn good match with some legends. They don't feel legendary to me anymore. And that's my biggest mm. complaint as a Hardy fan. More so mm. Jeff because fuck Matt. But what do you think about it, Jordan? <laughs> so here's the thing with the Hardys, right? It's kind of like a damned if you do, damned if you don't. Right. If we put everybody in a program with the Hardy Boys and we put the new tag teams over, that means that they're going to be on a losing streak. And Mm -hmm. we would complain if the Hardy Boys are on a losing streak. If we keep featuring the Hardy Boys and Jeff continues to do reckless things, um, we're going to look at it as, oh, Matt just needs Jeff so that Matt can keep a job. Which I don't think is true, but I feel like that would be something that the internet says. Then if we see Jeff and Matt together tag teaming consistently and they're winning all the time, then it's like, oh, it's these old cats that's not letting the new ones get any shine. Then 
if it's not either of those, it's like it's ju- it's just it's it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation, and that's one of the hardest things to do, especially when you have a tag team as legendary as the Hardy Boys, right? Like you don't want to make them look too weak. You also don't want to make them look too strong because if your idea is you want to create all these new popular tag teams, like you got to let the young cat shine in a in a sense. Um, it's just so difficult. I don't like this is the first time I'm going to say I don't know what Tony Khan should do. It's a very, very difficult decision, right? They like, want a nice retirement tour like they did Sting. But do like, they want to retire? That's a personal decision. Do they <laughs> want to retire? You know what I mean? Like Sting is on a retirement tour because Sting wants to pack it up and but get like, up on he out had, of like, here. like a good like two, three years here. You know? Who's Sting, right? Right, like two, yeah. three years. But he looked at great the whole time in, the old, inter- all the way out until they announced the retirement tour. That's right. what it should have felt like with the Hardys. But you think about it, that could have been the Hardys. But Jeff becoming a meme, Matt undergoing concussion protocol, and Rebby talking about that, Jeff getting into interactions with the cops and the substance abuse thing. We don't know what the plans were, but we do know that even if you had the most solid two, three year plan, there were so many things that happened during that time period that could have changed the absolute course of all of that. You know what I mean? So like, it's unfortunate, but like, I think, I actually think that Tony is kind of doing the right thing. Cause like, what, what do you do in a situation like this? You know what I'm saying? Like, what do you do? Granted, like Hardy's, Top three of all time. Top three tag team of all time. Because if it, if it wasn't them, it's... Well, at one point in time, if it wasn't them, it was Edge and Christian or the Dudley Boys. That three tag team trio set the tone for tag teams for the next 25 years. Especially when it came to TLC matches. But it's like, are we talk Like, with this 100 list, are we talking about the top 100 tag teams of all time? Are we talking about... The top 100 tag teams of the year. You have to factor in booking. Like it's it's complicated, but I'll, it's a lot. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's a tricky subject. But I'm I'm, I'm gonna pass it on to the people at home. But let me know what y'all think about the Hardys, their top 100 PI PWI ranking, as well as how would you book them? How would you book them considering everything that's happened in the past? Two to three years with the with the Hardys in AEW. But we're moving on. So this Saturday, I'm gonna get it right. I keep I'm, a, I'm always about to say Sunday, and then it's Saturday because I'm still not used to the fact that shows are on Saturdays instead of Sundays. But this Saturday, last WWE premium live event of the year, NXT deadline coming from Bridgeport, Connecticut. All right, we're gonna have predictions. But I'm also letting y'all know, 316 space, Saturday, be there. If not, you're a loser. I'll but we're going to get into these. You'll be, it's up. Um, but <laughs> let us know how you feel in the space. Join us in the space. We're going to always have a good time, so you don't want to miss out. But we're going to be giving our predictions. All right, so the first match of the night, kickoff show, Axiom versus Nathan Frazier. This is a non-title match. What's going on? Let Who do you have in this match? Let me get my Baron Corbin? Wait, no, no, no. What the hell? What am I looking at? What? Wait, where did you start on this list? I'm starting from the bottom. Axiom was, versus Nathan Why do you Frazier. do that? You put the list... <laughs> I'm just gonna say I'm gonna send it to you again. No, I, no I, it's fine. I'm looking at it. It's just that I opened up the list and he always does it from the bottom to the top. Pause. And my OC- pause. pause. But my pause. OCD wants to do it from the top to the bottom. Also pause. That's, that's, a, no, that's a stop. <laughs> that's a full blown stop. No, but like you don't start with the main event. You don't start with the main event. Why did but you yeah. Turn it out like this? <laughs> okay. That's a, that's a Pause. They say they want to do it from the bottom to the top. Hey, yo, yo. 
This is a PG program, okay? <laughs> Devil's a liar. But Axiom and Nathan Frazier, who do you have? Okay, <laughs> I'm going to go with Axiom. <laughs> who do you got? I got I got Axiom as well. I actually prefer, I, I really, really like Axiom. I love his style. So I'm going to go with Axiom. Now we're getting into the main card. This should be very, very interesting because of how the Carmelo Hayes versus Trick Williams feud is brewing. They have Carmelo at the top of the show Ooh. going against Lexus King, who it has been alleged that Carmelo Hayes is the one who reached out to Lexus King to get Trick Williams' line. So um, do you want Carmelo? Not want. Who do you think is going to win? Carmelo Hayes versus Lexus King. Well, Trick and Melo are still beefing, right? So wouldn't yeah. it make sense if Melo... Either Melo goes over or... No, I don't think Trick... Trick is still the baby face here. Carmelo's like the undercover. No, 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 no. It's, it's not Carmelo and Trick. It's Carmelo no, and know, Lexus King. No, I know, but I'm saying, like, they're still beefing. They're having their side beef, aren't they? Yeah, they're having a little tension. I don't right, call so it beef, Carmelo yeah. still has to look strong. That unless someone wants to cost Carmelo the match, I'm going to have to say that Carmelo has to look strong and go over to further in their feud. It's just Trick's not going to be on his side like that. Hmm. Or he may or he may be by his side and not actually do shit. Be like, well, you wasn't there for me, so collect yourself. Right. <laughs> what do you think? I think I'm going to go with... Um, hmm. I think I'm going to go with Mello. Now, actually, I'm going to go with Lexus. I'm going to go with Lexus King on this. I think he's going to go over. And I think okay. it's going to play a big, big part into the the feud between Mello and Trick because I feel like the, the main source of tension is that Carmelo refers to himself as him and Trick is ter- taking that title away from him because they can only be one him. It's not they. Mm. It's a him. It's one. There can only be one him. So... Going from that, we have a steel cage match with Roxanne Perez versus Kiana James. Man, Who when's the have? last time we've seen a woman's steel cage match in NXT? I think Gigi Dolan versus JC Jane. Yeah, we did. We definitely did. Yeah. And then before that, I felt like I haven't seen one since like Shayna versus Shayna versus what whatchamacallit? Um, um um the blonde one that became a fairy. Um <laughs> Candace blonde, blonde one that became a fairy <laughs> is nuts. Absolutely nuts. I'm, I'm, I'm so rude to Candace. She's so irrelevant to me. Um, but I like them both, and this is going to be such a good match. The bias in me wants wants Kiana because I'm low key in love with Kiana. Is that fair enough? <laughs> I kind of want Kiana to go That's over. Fair. But it's going to be a great match regardless. What do you think? I think that Kiana is going to go over as well. I feel like Roxanne... I feel like Kiana needs something to put her in that main event circle. And yes. I feel like a victory over Roxanne will do that. So I'm going to go with Roxanne. Sure the next match is for the NXT North American Championship... You have Dominic Mysterio versus Dragon Lee. Now, before we get into the predictions of this match, it is noted that the original match was Dominic Mysterio versus Wes Lee. Wes Lee currently has an injury uh, spinal. Apparently, he cannot feel his legs. Oh, my he God. Is now, he is now out for 8 to 12 months because he requires a spinal surgery. Um, That's crazy. So it'll be, it'll be out. Yeah, it's crazy. Rest up, Wes. You're going to get better. You're going to be better back than ever. Um, so going from that, uh, Dominic will have Rhea in, her, in his corner. Dragon Lee will have Rey Mysterio in his. So with that being said, do we have Dominic or do we have Dragon? My bad. I was trying to plug in my laptop. But, um, well, now that Wesley's not here, kind of obvious he's going over. Kind of yeah. a shame because I want to see that match, but mm. it is what it is. Dom was most likely keeping it to otherwise make the Judgment Day look more heelish as it is. So I'm gonna go with Dom, Dom Dom, as Rhea would say, Dom Dom. 
Did I do it with an accent? Was that an all scene of accent? Zom zom. I don't zom, know if zom. it was an accent. Dude, <laughs> that's I feel like zom, that's a that's a bird accent. <laughs> zom <A> zom. <laughs> But I'm going to go with Zom Zom too. I'm going to go with Dominic Mysterio. I feel like Dominic Mysterio is the best thing to happen to the North American title. Really? Since, since Adam Cole won it. Because when have we been this interested in that this championship? I feel like there's a couple times. There was Cole. There was Keith Lee when he had both belts. So and every time swerve. when a black person had it, it was fun. What yeah. do you mean? Yeah, every time Trick when Trick <laughs> had it, it was cool. Like, but I don't think that we've ever been this interested in a belt in this particular belt. Dom is the guy who's getting the most heat in WWE. So I feel like Dom is, is perfect for this. But I'm gonna go with Dom. I'm gonna go with Zom Zom. All right. So the next two matches are the Iron Survivor Challenge matches. Um, we got Tiffany Stratton. For the Women's Iron Survivor Challenge, we have Tiffany Stratton, we have Lash Legend, Blair Davenport, Kalani Jordan, and Fallon Henley. Who do we have winning this match? Ooh. 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 See, the bias in me wants to go straight to Kalani. (laughs) The bias in me likes Kalani. (laughs) She's cool. I like Kalani. No, I like her too. I like her look. I uh, I feel like they they're gonna want to do something with her regardless. Um, hmm. who the hell's Fallon Helly? Hold on, let me look her up real quick. For the accent question, Fallon Helly. She was a part of. She was serving. She's kind. She was kind of alongside that tag team with Briggs. I forgot like the. Oh, rest so of she's name. irrelevant. I just saw her picture. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Stop being mean to these wrestlers. Wow. I like you all. I'm sorry. I'm just. A bitch. Um, but <laughs> I, would go, I want either Kalani or Blair. I love Blair, but I'm going to say Kalani just because she's new and fresh. Although, she. Mm, 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 mm. No, nah, I'm going I'm to stay firm on Kalani. I trust you, baby girl. Mm. Kalani, go ahead. I, at first, I was going to say Kalani. Well, at first, I was going to say Blair Davenport, but a nice little wrench that's been thrown into this match is the fact that on the latest episode of NXT, Nikita Lyons returned. Oh, yes, she and, did. And Nikita and Blair have beef, and I feel like it's going to be rooted in the fact that Nikita was taken out by Blair. So I feel like Nikita is going to cause Blair this match, and I feel like it's going to get down to Blair and Kalani. And Nikita's a heel? No, 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 no. Blair's a heel. I feel like no, it's going to come down to... No, Nikita's going to cost the match. That's why I'm like... It's going to cost Blair the match. Okay. Okay. Because Blair's okay. a heel, and Blair was the one that injured Nikita. So, I feel like Kalani is going to win, because the last Iron Survivor Challenge match, I believe Tiffany Stratton won. Mm. Um, so, I'm going to go with Kalani Jordan. Now for the men's Iron Survivor Challenge match. We have Dijic, Trick Williams, Josh Briggs, Braun Breaker, and Tyler Bate. Damn, Braun Who Breaker wins this match? God damn. Like, go to the main roster already, nigga. Um, I'm going to go with my baby daddy, Trick. Because who the fuck else? Who the fuck else? By the way, thank you so much for the t-shirt trick. I'm like three weeks late on announcing this. But thank you so much for sending me a t-shirt. But... Yeah, who would I be if I didn't support my baby daddy at all times? Luckily, I don't have a baby mother or father in this equation, so I can have an unbiased prediction. (laughs) But no, 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 I'm going to have to go with Trick. I'm going to have to go with Trick Williams because I feel like, once again, it's going to add to the story between Mello and Trick. I feel like Mello... I feel like this is Trick's time and it's Mello's decline. And I feel like Mello losing at the top of the show and Trick winning towards the end of the show is going to just add to that story. Mm-hmm. So going from that, we have the NXT championship match between Ilya Dragunov and Baron Corbin. Who do we have in this match? Ooh. Ooh. I kind of like Baron Corbin. But but it's the end of the year show. 
Mm. Do we really put over a main roster star at the end of the year show? No, I changed my answer. Ilya, uh, if I say his name right, Ilya Dragunov. I'm going to go with him. Go with him. Same. I'm going to go with Ilya Dragunov. I feel like this is just going to be another main roster name that's kind of used to elevate the talent down in NXT. And I feel like Ilya has the potential to have a really special run. So I'm going to go with Ilya Dragunov. And that concludes our NXT deadline predictions. If you agree with us or if you don't agree with us, let us know in the comments below. But that also concludes our show. Hopefully you guys can join us on December 9th in the 316 space for NXT deadline. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. And we will see you guys next week. Bye.